the previous video, we discussed at a high level some of MLTT's characteristics and some motivations for why we wanted to study it. Now it's time to get down to the nuts and bolts. So let's start with a part of MLTT we've already discussed, judgments. There are four different judgments we can make in MLTT. We saw two of these in the last video. On the top right, we have the typing judgment that X is a term of type T. And on the bottom right, we have the judgment that X and X prime are judgmentally equal terms of type T. For all the things that we want to do, we'll need two more. The one on the top left is pronounced T is a type, and it asserts just that. When we're introducing new types, as we'll start to do in just a minute, this will be our way of asserting, in the formal language of MLTT, the existence of a certain type. And finally, on the bottom left, we have judgmental equality of types. So, like terms, we can formally state that T and T prime are actually the same. And that's it. Just these four will be all we need. Now, one quick note. Recall that the main point of the first video was that we had a, a bunch of different ways to understand what these judgments mean. We interpreted the terms and types as either points of spaces, which we called the homotopy interpretation, or as witnesses to propositions, the logic interpretation. These new judgments are interpreted appropriately as asserting the existence of a certain space or proposition and asserting the equality of spaces or propositions. So here's a quick look at the overall to-do list for specifying MLTT. In order to specify and study the types of MLTT, we recursively define what types are available. Now, for more basic type theories, like the simply type lambda calculus, it's possible to just give a single recursive definition that articulates exactly what all the types are. Then after you've done that, you can say what the terms of each type are. But MLTT is more complex. One of MLTT's key features is that it is a dependent type theory. We'll talk a lot about dependent types later, a lot more. But briefly what that means is that there are types in MLTT whose definition depends on the terms of another type. So in order to define what all the types of MLTT are, we must simultaneously specify the terms too. So the definitions I give here are technically what's called mutually recursive. Mutual recursion is a bit more tricky technically, but everything checks out. The framework we use to define the terms of MLTT is a standard one, but it can take some getting used to if you're not familiar with it. The approach is to define objects called contexts. Everything we'll do will be with respect to a given context, so we won't have terms, we'll have terms in context. This context machinery we're tacking on will sometimes be superfluous, but sometimes it'll be absolutely critical to be able to define what we want. The system of types, contexts, and terms and contexts constitutes the formal language of MLTT, and then the formal deductive calculus will be given as inference rules which can be chained together to form derivations. These inference rules will formally specify how MLTT works. So when I was talking a moment ago about mutual recursion, here's what that means for us. In order to define contexts, we'll have to assume we already have the types defined. Then we'll recursively define the types, making use of contexts. This seems a little circular, but don't worry, it actually works out totally fine. So let's define contexts. A context consists of a finite list of typing judgments, like this. Here, T1 through Tn are types, and X1 through Xn are distinct variables. It's important to note that the order matters rearranging the judgments results in a different context. So what we're doing here is asserting a bunch of variables are of certain types. In programming with types, this is usually a basic mechanism of the language, declaring typed variables. Under our logical interpretation, 
A context is a list of assumptions. If terms are witnesses and types are propositions, then declaring terms x1 through xn of types t1 through tn respectively is assuming the truth of the propositions t1 through tn and moreover assigning names to our pieces of evidence. x1 witnesses the truth of t1, x2 witnesses the truth of t2, and so on. This shows why we care that the list is in order. The proposition t2 could be about the witness x1 of t1. That only makes sense if the judgment x1 is of type t1 comes before x2 is of type t2 in the context. This is the notion of type dependency I mentioned a second ago, by the way. And finally, our homotopy interpretation of this is that t1 through tn are spaces. So we're putting a name to different points of the spaces. x1 is a point of the space t1, x2 of t2, and so on. So we can put these notions together to get the notion of judgments in context. We'll generally use the letters gamma and delta to denote arbitrary contexts. And so if gamma is a context, we can make each of our judgments from before in context gamma. So given a judgment j, write gamma turnstile j to make the judgment j in the context gamma. Why do we want to do this? What this allows us to do is to construct new things in our language, but assume some things already are, exist to build it out of. So for instance, the second judgment. In context gamma, x is of type t. Well, maybe the term x is formed as a particular combination of some other terms of some other types. To make that formal in MLTT, we put the required terms in gamma. So the judgment in context gamma, x is of type t, means that if you have terms of all the appropriate types called for by gamma, then there's some way you can combine them to make the term x of type t. Like I said, sometimes the context will be irrelevant and it won't get too much in the way, but this trick of using the context to require certain structure in order to make the judgment is often necessary, even for simpler type theories than MLTT. The second judgment, by the way, is the aforementioned term in context. It's a term of a given type, but made in reference to and perhaps making use of a certain context. The language of MLTT is just judgments in context, and the formalization of mathematics in MLTT is just the rephrasing of an informal mathematical argument as a bunch of judgments in context. But there's one more thing we need for that, a deductive system. We need a way to construct formal arguments out of judgments in context. That is, give a way to prove which judgments in context are quote unquote true. Our deductive system will be built out of inference rules. An inference rule is a concise way to make a statement of the form, if something, then something. The somethings will be judgments in context. So if h1 through hk and c are judgments in context, this inference rule says that if h1 through hk hold or are true, then so too does c. If h1 through hk, then deduce c. So here's when we'll have an MLTT. Let gamma be some context. If t is a type in context gamma, then in context gamma, t is judgmentally equal to itself. This is just a basic statement of how judgmental equality of types works. Here's another example where the context is different on the top and the bottom. If in context gamma, t is a type, and in context gamma, we have any judgment j, then in the context gamma extended with x of type t, we have the same judgment again. This rule will be a useful structural rule for adding stuff to the context, but keeping the judgment intact. Whenever we write a generic j like this to the right of the turnstile, this is a meta variable for any of our four judgments. This convention will save us from constantly writing essentially the same inference rule four times. If you've seen inference rules before, 
you might know that they can be stacked together to form proof trees. We'll do exactly that a bit later. But before we get to that, we actually have enough right now to start defining some types. As these examples show, inference rules describe how the terms and types and contexts work together. Indeed, inference rules will be the form we use to introduce the, all the terms and types of MLTT and later homotopy type theory. So let's start with some of our primary examples. A very basic feature of most major programming languages are booleans. In typed programming languages, this usually manifests as a type of booleans. So it'll look something like this. The value true is a boolean, as is the value false. So bool, or something like that, is the type of booleans, and true and false are the two values of that type. Usually, there's also an if-then-else construct, which allows you to construct terms of the form if boolean, then one term, else another. The terms in the then branch and the else branch of this construction are required to be of the same type, because this expression will reduce to one or the other, depending on the boolean value. So, for example, if true, then five, else four, will reduce to five. Whereas, if false, then 5 else 4, yields 4. The exact syntax varies, but this is a pretty common feature to have in your language, and is useful for tons of different things. We said that Martin Loeb type theory will mimic type programming language in a lot of ways, and this is one of them. In MLTT, we'll also have a type of booleans, which we'll write with a blackboard too, but out of habit I might still pronounce it bool. And it also has exactly two terms, which we'll write as 0 and 1. You can think of one of these as being true and the other as false. Both conventions, 1 is true or 0 is true, are in use, so pick your favorite. To assert the existence of this type formally in MLTT, we'll use inference rules. And this will be our first example of a four-step methodology for introducing a new type. The first step is formation. We have an inference rule asserting that bool is a type. Here, and wherever we don't say otherwise, gamma is an arbitrary context. So this says that, under no assumptions, i.e. there's no hypotheses on the top, we can assert that, in whatever context, bool is a type. Next comes introduction, where we stipulate the ways of forming terms of this type. As mentioned, there are exactly two such terms, as we formally written here. Next, we have what are called elimination and computation rules of the type. Take these as preliminary statements of how to eliminate and compute booleans in MLTT. We'll need to introduce dependent types before we can state the full version. Elimination is the formal expression of our if-then-else construct. Given terms p0 and p1 of some type t and a boolean x, we can form this term of type t. If x is 0, then the whole expression is p0. If x is 1, then the whole expression is p1. All we're saying with the elimination rule is that, either way, it ends up being a term of type t. It's the computation rules which codify our understanding of this as an if-then-else. Definitely read through them and make sure that they make sense. Let's do another example, but before we do, let's revisit the formation. Gamma, again, is any context, including the empty context. So we're declaring this type into existence wholesale. It doesn't depend on any other types, and it isn't built out of previously defined types. Our second example is going to be a type construction, i.e. a way of combining existing types to form new ones. To motivate it, let's talk about product spaces. So far, we've been kind of nebulous about what a space is in our homotopy interpretation. So let's start off with two basic examples. The interval is a continuous line segment of a finite extent containing its endpoints. For concreteness, we'll call one endpoint zero the other one, and think of the points in between as all real numbers between zero and one. 
This is a space. Another example of a space is a unit square in the plane containing all the points on its boundary and all the points inside. Now there's a relationship between these two. We can view a square as an interval extended along another interval. If I took this interval and dragged it along this other interval, it would cover the area of the unit square. If we think of spaces as collections of points, this is expressed by saying that the square is the set of pairs of interval points. So every point of the square can be given coordinates, one on this interval and one on this interval. We'll think of this as multiplication. An interval times an interval is a square. Of course, we can do the same thing with more spaces than just intervals. An interval times a filled in square is a cube. An interval times the boundary of a square is the four side bases of a cube. An interval times a disk is a solid cylinder. An interval times a circle is a hollow tube. A solid disk times a circle is a solid torus, and so on. You can continue to think of these simple examples, but you'll quickly find that it gets impossible to imagine. What's a circle times a circle times a circle times a circle? What's a solid torus times an interval times a hollow sphere? One of the most remarkable things about homotopy type theory is that we can actually give answers to some of these kinds of questions and prove properties of these bizarre spaces which we cannot even imagine. Remember, we're interpreting types as spaces. So if we have a way of multiplying spaces, we should have a corresponding way of multiplying types. And we do. In this video, we're only going to give the formation and introduction rules. The elimination and computation rules will have to wait for later. Here's the formation rule. If A and B are types in context gamma, then A times B is also a type in context gamma. So notice we're now making use of hypotheses in the inference rule. We're not asserting an independently existing type A times B. A times B is a type formed from the types A and B, which by hypothesis already exist, given whatever is in gamma. And how do we get terms of this type? Well, in the same way that we said that points of the square are pairs of points on the interval, terms of type a times B are pairs of terms of A and B. Formally, if X is a term of type A in context gamma and Y a term of B in gamma, then in gamma, the pair XY is a term of type A times B. To make sure that the relation of judgmental equality behaves right, we need to throw in a so-called congruence rule, asserting that judgmental equalities of pairs is just component-wise judgmental equality. And then, as mentioned, we'll cover the elimination and computation rules once we have more of the heavy machinery of MLTT on the table. But the main thrust of those rules will be asserting that the only terms of this type are pairs. For any term of type A times B, we can decompose it into an A component and a B component, which uniquely identify. And finally, let's do one example which is motivated by our logical interpretation of MLTT. A primary goal of mathematical logic is to formally represent the various patterns of reasoning used in constructing arguments, especially mathematical arguments. Let's consider one of the most basic argumentative structures possible, implication. An implication is a claim of the form if P then Q, where P and Q are some assertions or propositions. P is often called the antecedent, and Q the consequent. To prove if P then Q, also pronounced P implies Q, you assume the antecedent P, and then use that assumption, and other assumptions, lemmas, definitions, whatever, to obtain a proof of the consequent Q, if P then Q. As a simple mathematical example, take this statement. 
for any sets A, B, the intersection of A and B is a subset of A. Using the standard definition of subset, what this claim says is that for any X, if X is in A intersect B, then X is in A. So we need to prove this implication for arbitrary X. The elementary set theoretic proof of this would be pick arbitrary X, assume X is in A intersect B. By definition of set intersection, X is in A and X is in B. So we have that X is in A, done. Assume the antecedent, prove the consequent. What does this look like in proof relevant mathematics? Remember from before that proof relevance means that we name and keep track of the witnesses to propositions. So we would say, pick arbitrary x and let h be a witness to the fact that x is in a intersect b. So x in a intersect b is a proposition, a statement which is either true or false. And we're assuming that h is a witness to its truth. Now the definition of what it means for x to be in A intersect B is that x is in A and x is in B. So we'll think of the definition of set intersection as converting between these. It takes the witness H that x is in A intersect B and produces two witnesses. H1 witnesses that x is in A and H2 witnesses x is in B. We don't care about H2, but H1 witnesses the claim we wanted, x is in A. So the proof of the implication is a process which takes H as an input and produces H1 as output. Here's where the proof relevance becomes, well, relevant. If I have different witnesses of the claim that X is in A intersect B, then I could get different witnesses of X in A out of this proof. So in the proof relevant world, a witness to an implication P arrow Q not only encodes the fact that if P then Q, but specifies how the witnesses of P are transformed into witnesses of Q. The primary law governing implication is known as modus ponens. Stated in the, in the proof irrelevant way, modus ponens says, given P and P implies Q, deduce Q. The reason modus ponens gets a cool Latin name, by the way, is that it has been a fundamental rule of logic for a very long time. So using our example, given the hypotheses X is in A intersect B and X in A intersect B implies X in A, conclude that X is in A. Now with proof relevance, if H witnesses X in A intersect B and F witnesses the implication, then we'll write F of H for the resulting witness of X in A produced by inputting H to the witness transformation F. That's the proof relevant modus ponens. Since terms are witnesses, we'll represent these witness transformations as transformations of terms. And we're going to use a standard notation called lambda notation to write down these transformations. The form is lambda variable name dot output expression. So our proof from earlier, which took H and returned H1, would be written like this, lambda H dot H1. And again, it's of type X in A intersect B implies X in A. So that's a simple example of how to use lambda notation. One key thing to note here is that the expression to the right of the dot can refer to the variable name, in this case, H. That'll be important in a moment. Now here's a list of different types with arrows in them, and I invite you to try to write terms of these types in lambda notation. I'll do the first two, but if you want to try them yourself first, you should pause the video and do that now. A term of type P arrow P is lambda H dot H. It takes in a witness H of P and returns H, which is a witness of P. Simple. The second is a little bit more interesting. Again, I start my term with a lambda to assume a witness of P, but I'll call my variable little p this time. Now, after the dot, I need to write down a term of type Q implies P. 
To prove an implication, assume the antecedent. So I'll write lambda little q to introduce an assumption of q. Now I need to write down a term witnessing p, but I already have one, little p. So I'll just write little p there. So what this term does is take in a witness p of p and return a witness lambda q dot p of q implies p. Have fun with the other two. Let's do this officially in MLTT now. Our formation rule will be similar to the formation rule of binary products. Given two types A and B in context gamma, A arrow B is a type in context gamma. Our introduction rule for arrow types will be our first significant use of contexts. Recall that our logical interpretation of contexts was as a list of assumptions. We'll make good on this interpretation by using it to encode the assumptions we need to make sense of implications. Formally, our rule is this. Suppose that in context gamma plus a variable x of type a, we have a way of constructing a term e, which might refer to x, hence why we write e of x, which is of type b. Suppose that in context gamma plus a variable x of type a, we have a way of constructing a term e of type b, which might refer to x, hence why we write e of x. Then we can do what's called lambda abstraction and form, in context gamma, the term lambda x dot e of x, which takes witnesses of a to witnesses of b, i.e. is a witness of the implication a arrow b. So roughly, if you're able to prove b with a proof of a in context, then you can abstract this proof transforming process as a witness of A implies B. Like with binary products, we'll have a congruence rule to state that this lambda abstraction process respects judgmental quality in the appropriate sense. Our elimination rule will essentially be modus ponens. If I can form a term F of type A arrow B in gamma, then in gamma plus X of type A, I can apply F to X also called evaluating f at x, to get a term of type b. So if I have a witness x of my antecedent a, and a witness f of a implies b, then I can have a witness f of x of my consequent b. And finally, I have two rules governing how lambda abstraction and evaluation interact. The first one, known as the beta rule, says that applying lambda y dot e of y to x is the same thing as e of x. So in a sense, lambda abstracting and then evaluating gets you back where you start. And the eta rule says the other way around. If you have f from a to b, then apply it to some x, then a lambda abstract the x, you end up with f back. In other words, a lambda term that just takes an argument and applies f to it is the same thing as f itself. And those are the rules introducing arrow types. So we've covered the introduction of three examples of types. The constant type 2, which we interpreted as the type of booleans in type programming. The type construction of binary products, which we interpreted as the multiplication operation of extending one space along another. And the type construction of arrow types, which we interpreted logically as implications. But each of these constructs can be interpreted under each of these interpretations. For instance, the type 2 interpreted as a space is a space consisting of two isolated points. So 2 times an interval gives us two intervals. Interpreted as logic, binary products are conjunction or logical and. A witness of p times q is a pair little p little q where P witnesses P and Q witnesses Q. So in order to have a witness of P times Q, you need a witness of P and a witness of Q. In type programming, a term of the type A arrow B is a function whose input type or domain is A and whose result type or codomain is B. Writing a function of type A arrow B in a type programming language consists of constructing a term 
the quote unquote body of a function whose type is B, where we can freely make reference to the argument of the function, which will be a term of type A. To help build your understanding, it might help to think through each of these constructs in each of these interpretations. And moving forward, we'll continue to introduce new types and type constructions to MLTT without spelling out each of these three interpretations. And so you're highly encouraged to, to do that work on your own. Do that long enough, and you'll start to get a sense of just how incredibly rich this type system can be.